continue to delve deeper into our theme of the month which is strengthening our stakes and as this month comes to a close I would like to encourage you wherever you are to focus on building your capacity and availing yourself to be used for the glory of the Lord. My name is Masi Sirali and I would like to invite you wherever you are get up on your feet call your neighbors call your family call your friends and let's have some good time in the presence of the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. This moment, we invite you as we worship the Lord, as we exalt the name of Jesus. However you are, come on, Father, we lift your name high. Lord, we exalt your name. Even in this moment, as we start, we are going to say that, Father, let your name be lifted high above every other name Amen. come on open up your mouth and give god words of worship for he is worthy for he is highly exalted father this moment this moment that you have made that we will be in your presence we declare that let your name be lifted high let your name be lifted high above all the other names we open our hearts to you O oh god wide as the sky and we say father let your name be lifted high and let every other name fade away jesus let every other name fade away yes god
arise in our nation, to arise in our midst. Father, let your peace, let your joy arise in us, oh God. Come on, don't be silent. This is the moment to speak. Speak and ask the Lord and let your glory rise in my life. As youth, let the glory rise within us, Father. of us, oh God. More of you, Lord, and less of what we want. More of you, Jesus, and less of what we desire. More of your presence, oh God. More of your spirit is what we pray for this morning. Father, we surrender to you. Go ahead and tell the Lord, I surrender to you, Lord. I ask for more of your spirit, more of your anointing. Do not be silent. More of
just sing that with us. Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? I'm not enough. I'm not enough. Unless you Greetings to you in Jesus' name. It's such a joy to have you watching from wherever you are. My name is Finney, and I'll be sharing with you the word today. Um, this year, our theme has been taken from Isaiah 54, verse 2. It says, Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Spare not. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stacks. And we've been focusing on three things. Enlarge lengthen and strengthen today my focus is on strengthen so join me in this summer service as we get along on strengthening our stacks particularly my sermon title is strengthening our stacks by grace or you could call this strengthened by grace and i'll take my reading from second timothy chapter 4 verse 7. second timothy chapter 4 verse 7 it reads, 
I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul says, I have fought a good fight. To finish the race, Paul addresses two things the fight and the faith, calling our attention to a previous victory and an ongoing faith. The fight and the faith. In being strengthened by grace, I will address two things that were a priority to Paul. You know, after Paul saying this, after Paul saying, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the rest, and I have kept the faith. Two verses later, in verse 7, he says, For Demas, because he loved this world, he deserted me. It's interesting that he gives us his own example as one who has finished the rest. Then he also gives us an example of a colleague who didn't finish the rest. Paul is telling us we all have a rest to finish. And we shouldn't be blind to the reality that some have actually not finished. Take heed that you finish the rest. Let me tell you something. The root of all human conflict is found in first my inability to see another person as being created in the image of God. I'll say that again. The root of all human conflict is found first in my inability to see another person as being created in the image of God. And secondly, it is found in my inability to treat myself as a unique individual. Two things. First, my inability to see someone else as being created in the image of God. And so that gives me reason not to treat them equally. It causes me to dehumanize my neighbor instead of treating them with the same dignity I desire for myself. And secondly, my inability to recognize my own uniqueness. When I don't recognize my uniqueness, life becomes a competition. When I don't recognize my uniqueness, life becomes a competition. And I can suffer from what many today call the victim mentality. God has created us in a very general sense, equal in his image. And in a very particular sense, as unique individuals with a particular gift. God has created us fearfully and wonderfully, as it is in Psalms chapter 139, verse 14, that we are created fearfully and wonderfully. Wonderfully to treat each other with beauty seeing others as valuable. Wonderfully, to treat each other with beauty, seeing others as valuable. Then fearfully, to treat myself with beauty as a unique individual with a specific purpose. When I don't see this beauty in others and in myself, that becomes the root of conflict. While the first one has a lot to do with the second party, when I don't look at my neighbor as someone of value. The second one is entirely up to me when I don't look at myself as a unique individual. And I call this uniqueness a deposit of God himself in you because he created you with a distinctive gift. This gift is a specific gift to fulfill a calling. It is a gift, a tool for your ministry. So Paul, in completing his ministry, is reminding us that we have a specific calling, a ministry to accomplish. We can't afford to live like we don't have a responsibility that all we can do is to love this world. No, we can't afford to do that. The question is, what was Paul's secret? How did he accomplish this task? The secret of Paul is what I want to draw our attention to. You see, having looked at the two examples, Paul and Demas. Let's back up a little bit and look at these two people. These two people were colleagues. Paul and Demas were co-workers. In Philemon chapter 1 verse 24, we read about them being co-workers. So what happened? How come that suddenly Demas has deserted his co-worker? What happened? How come Paul finished, but Demas didn't. I need to remind you that no one wakes up loving God tomorrow and hating him tomorrow and hating him the next day. Let me say that again. 
No one wakes up loving God today and hating him tomorrow. It doesn't happen that way. It's a progressive downhill. It's a progression. It's not an instant. You're either red hot for God or damn cold. Love is not static. It is growing. It is either growing hot or cold. Life itself teaches us this lesson. Everyone is growing. The difference is that some grow old while others grow up. Growing old is adding another number to your birthday, while growing up is holistic maturity. So how did Paul grow? How did Paul grow to treasure finishing this race while his colleague deserted this race? Remember, we are talking about being strengthened by grace. And I will take a scripture that will help us see how Paul finished this race. First, Paul grew to treasure his calling more than life itself. And I'll say that again. Paul grew to treasure his calling more than life itself. In Acts chapter 20 verse 24, Paul says, But I do not count my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I have received from the Lord. Acts chapter 20 verse 24. Let me read it again. But I do not count my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I've received from the Lord Jesus. Paul is saying something very profound here. What Paul is saying is that fulfilling your ministry is more important than staying alive. Fulfilling your ministry is more important than staying alive. And this conviction is what makes the lives of those radically devoted to a specific calling very inspiring for us to watch. When someone is devoted to their calling more than they're even about just being alive, their lives are so inspiring for us to watch. But how is this possible? How is someone able to treasure a calling more than life itself? How is this possible? This is possible when I begin to recognize that the one who calls is the highest treasure I can ever have. So Paul didn't just treasure the calling because it was some nice thing. He didn't treasure the calling because it was something that maybe was paying. He didn't treasure the calling because it was something that gave him status in community. He didn't treasure the calling because it was cool, no. That's not the reason he treasured the calling. He treasured the calling because the one who called him meant everything to him. The one who called him meant everything to him. How do I know this? In Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, Paul says, But whatever were gains to me, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Whatever was of gain to me, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. And in verse 8, he says, What is more, I consider everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost everything. I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. That is what Paul teaches us is the secret, the number one secret in finishing this race. Everything else, everything else becomes secondary compared to treasuring the one who has called us to this race. And that's very important because, you know, let me tell you something. When I give you a phone call and you don't have my number, before you can be interested in what I'm saying, you want to know, who is this who was called? That is what Paul is telling us, that the one who calls must be a treasure far above anything else if we are to finish this calling. Because the one who calls will uphold you. Now, all of us can survive abundant poverty. The question I want to ask us is that when all these things start coming, all these things that Paul considers as loss, when they all start coming our way and suddenly we have abundant wealth, will all our gains be considered loss compared to knowing Christ? And I'm reminded of Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, where the Bible tells me, Seek first the kingdom of God. 
seek first the kingdom of God. David said something very profound in Psalms chapter 46, and I'll read it for you. In Psalms chapter 46, verse 1, David said, The Lord God is my ever present help in times of need. I want to remind you that if you need to know and check if God is first in your life, God is present. Whom do you call to when you are in trouble? God is present. Whom do you call to when you are in trouble? David is telling us, the Lord is my ever-present help in times of need. And so, when we think about finishing this race and being strengthened by grace, it is, it is something that tells us we must start with God being first in our lives. God must be fast in your finances. God must be fast in your interests. God must be full all over your speech. And God is present in your troubles. The second thing that we realize that Paul tells us was very helpful in him finishing strong. Remember, I said I will share with you two things that were priority in the life of Paul. The first was that he treasured God as first, and everything else became secondary. He treasured the one who called first. Then the calling became a light burden that the one who called carried him through. Paul was very keen to attribute every success to God's grace. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, by the grace of God, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. That is a very keen thing to take note of. Though it was not I, he continues, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. When Paul worked harder than the rest, he didn't attribute it to anything but grace. Can you daily wake up and say, I have reached this place because of his grace? Can you daily attribute all that you are and all that you have and all of your being to the grace of God? Then we begin to realize that everything, even the strength that we have, is supplied by God alone. First Peter chapter 4, verse 11, is very keen on this. In First Peter chapter 4, verse 11, we are reminded that everything that we do, it is because God has supplied. God has supplied. God has supplied strength. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. That's what 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11 tells us. And I continue. If anyone serves, they should serve with the strength God provides. So that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Now, that's a very interesting one. To remind us that Paul considered God as fast. We took the letter fast. Now, to remind us that Paul always gave glory to God, to remind us that Paul was keen to recognize the grace of God in his life, I want to take another word. I want to take another word. And that is the very word God. The word God, G-O-D. I must remind us that the word God personally reminds me of three things. That one, the letter G, God must be glorified. God must be glorified. Secondly, the letter O, others matter. Others matter. Thirdly, the letter D, die to self. Die to self. Every one who accomplishes a task has come to a point where they thought they wouldn't finish it. They wouldn't finish it. And there is a sacrifice that kept them going. There's a sacrifice that kept them going. God must be glorified in everything that we do. In everything that we do, God gets the glory. 
This is why God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. This satisfaction in Him and in Him alone will mean all other satisfactions can be counted as loss. God is most glorified when you are most satisfied in Him. God is most glorified when all other satisfactions have been counted as lost to the extent that you are valuing other people more than you value stuff. You value human beings more than you value things. God must be glorified, others must matter, and then you will die to self. G-O-D. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. That is the secret behind the joy of every believer. And that's why when we come to the end of this life, we want to come to the end of this life full of joy. The experience of grace is a subject of the past, it's a subject of the present, and it's a subject of the future. The experience of grace is a subject of the past, subject of the present as the subject of the future. Paul, in the scripture that we have read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, does not trace his obedience back to thankfulness for past grace. He doesn't say, Lord, because you did this and the other, I am working harder. He doesn't say, Lord, because you did this for someone else, I am working harder. No, he says, God, it is your grace. He would have said, I have worked harder than all of them because I have experience. He would have said, I would have, he would have said, I have worked harder than all of them because of my skill, because of my prowess. But he traces his obedience up to that moment by the grace that arrives for every moment. He is banking on the promises of God's grace to arrive at every moment of need. I will say that again. He is banking on the promises of God. And he's saying, God, you have promised this about the future. And because you've promised this about the future, I am trusting that there will be grace for it. Let me say that again. Grace is a subject of the past. It's a subject of the present. And it's a subject of the future. It's the subject of the past because of the testimonies that God has brought you this far. It's the subject of the present because of the reality that without God, you wouldn't come this far. It's the subject of the future because God's promises are upheld by Him. He, so Paul is banking on the promises of God's grace to arrive at every moment whenever he will need grace. So Paul says... God's work in me, God is working in me to will and to do according to his God, good pleasure. So Paul knows that grace has carried him. He knows grace is carrying him. And he knows that grace will carry him. This is what makes us face the future with a kind of endurance that even if it takes the shedding of our own blood, even if it takes our sweat, we will finish the rest because God's grace is sufficient. Even if it takes losing our lives, we will finish the rest because God's grace is sufficient. It has been sufficient and it will be sufficient. And that is the experience that our brother Stephen had. Let me give you that example. In Acts chapter 6 verse 8 it tells us Acts chapter 6 verse 8 says and Stephen full of grace and power was doing great works and signs among us the people if you are not strengthened by grace your strength will fail you one preacher I loved said this if you are a praying Christian your faith will carry you but if you are not a praying Christian you will have to carry your faith and this is not something you are designed for and so, if grace doesn't carry you, you will need your strength to carry you. But we are reminded that even our strength will fail. Our strength will fail. I want to close by reminding ourselves of the two things that we have said. One is that Paul treasured God who called him. 
more than anything else. And that is what made him finish the race. Secondly, Paul was very keen to remember that he has come this far. He is going far and he will finish because God's grace is not just a subject of the past. It is not just a subject of the present, but it's also a subject of the future. I pray that you will be strengthened by the grace of God. God richly bless you as you run the race to finish the call. God bless you. Thank you, Finney, for that amazing sermon. I hope we were all blessed and learned something from it. Right now, it's time to give. I encourage you to send your tithes and offering using the numbers on your screen. And remember, the Lord loves a cheerful giver.